Let us pray. Holy God, say to us, do to us and reveal within us the things that will make us whole and holy. Let our hearts and our minds be open that as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed, we may listen well. We may listen to what you say to us today and respond to you with faithfulness and love. Quiet us now and speak your word to us. Amen. From John's Gospel, the 12th chapter, we hear these words. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went to told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it cannot bear fruit. It dies. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servants also be. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the rulers of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we say, thanks be to God. Amen. So Karen and I uh, traveled to Bethsaida, or at least we think we were in Philip and Andrew's hometown. You don't actually know where the town is because it has not yet been uncovered or recovered, but we were close enough for it to count. What we do know is Bethsaida is a few kilometers north of Capernaum and was probably an insignificant fishing town. We read in the gospel that Andrew and his brother Simon were fishermen and they were called by Jesus to follow him. They were the first disciples. Now, along our way in Israel, there were some significant places in which we visited in Galilee, Capernaum, Tapka, the Mount of the Beatitudes, the River Jordan. And the reason we paused at Bethsaida and it was important was because it is likely the place in which the feeding of the 5,000 occurred. We had... We had good time there, and we had time there to sit and experience. No Clark Griswold tour guide heading us quickly along, come see, I have another surprise for you, come. We could sit and breathe, imagine possibilities, staring over the Sea of Galilee's hearing the sounds of the small waves break against the rocky shores, experiencing the smell of the fish. We had time to sit and breathe and experience that place where Philip and his brother, Andrew and Simon, came from. 
We also traveled to Jerusalem and experienced the masses there. There were, that was a completely different feel. People everywhere, way too stimu stimulation for my brain and my being. We experienced the pushing and the pushy people. It was noisy and loud and dirty and it was noisy. Did I tell you how noisy it was and loud? It was loud and noisy and busy. We could not even imagine ever returning to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover when the city is crammed full of people. The Jewish people come to Jerusalem on Passover to commemorate their liberation by God from slavery in Egypt and then their freedom as a nation under Moses. Now, I, we heard that, that from our text this morning is that there are masses of people in Jerusalem experiencing the festival of Passover. And Jesus, the very good Jew, with his disciples have gathered there too. But something very interesting happens in the, in the telling of this story. A shift occurs. Jesus, when he entered for Passover celebration, he literally enters a new stage. And we hear it in this simple phrase, the hour has come. It's code, biblical code for the time has arrived. Jesus, we know, very shortly will be denied by Judas, arrested, judged guilty by Pilate, crucified as a criminal on a cross, laid in a tomb, resurrected and ascended into heaven, sitteth on the right hand of God the Father. It is a hinge moment in the life of Jesus' story. When it changes, his passion now begins. Now, theologically, the central point of the text is the complete obedience of Jesus to the Father. Because he has lived for no other purpose than to completely offering himself to God. Jesus is now fully prepared for his hour of suffering and shame and death. The story begins the telling of the climax, which is and points to his obedient life. Theologically, it is about complete obedience that Jesus has for his Father. But we know that that does not end the story. It's a new beginning. There's still more to hear. We know that. For the God who embodies human shows by his ultimate love that Dying on the cross is not the end. And Jesus takes it upon himself in the whole of human situation to make it possible for us to say yes to life in the now and yes to life in the future. Yes to the promise of life which is to come. And no matter what evil forces are around in Jesus' day or in our day, no matter what powers and principalities close closely in upon us, whatever drones hover above, nothing in all of creation can separate us from God's love because Jesus is a completely obedient. So that's the main thing theological point of our text. And when you go home to read it again, read it with that. Jesus is complete obedience. Now for some learning, let me suggest that we too can learn about this notion of obedience I guess today the word obey has this negative kind of feel to it. We see obedience as forced behavior, unwilling decision to do something that we don't want to do, so we have to obey. We lump the meaning of obedience and compliance together. But what I'll suggest to you is that in the Bible, love, trust, and action equals obedience. And that's the formula we need to put in our heads and in our hearts, that love, trust, and action is the formula for faithful discipleship. In the New Testament, the word obedience is a, is, a, is a Greek word 
which is the compound of two separate Greek words, one hupo, under, and the other akuo, to hear. So biblically, obey is to hear under. So obedience involves attentive listening with a heart of submission and a willingness to act. It's really sweet. It is an, an active, attentive listening with the heart to do what you are called to do and then the ability to act upon it. Obedience to God may be the pathway to the life you want to live, the more excellent way. It is the way we learn how to mature and let God in our lives gently nur nurturing us so we can be who God desires us to become. C.S. Lewis writes, obeying is also intrinsically good. For in obeying a rational creature consciously enacts its creaturely role, reverses the act by which we fell, trends Adam's dance backwards. Obedience gets us back to where we can be whole and holy. So what we can learn is not just a theological central point, but what we can learn from the text is that we can die to our selfish love. We can lean on God's promises, and we can become more obedient to God's desire for our living. We can live as Christ, as God creates us to live. So live your life. Go and live your life today, the life that God desires for you. And that's what Jesus is teaching us. And that's a good message for you to take home with you. Live your life, the life that God desires for you. So now I want you to notice something else in the text before we conclude. It comes from the phrase, it is for this reason that I have come. Now we already know the context in which what Jesus is saying. He is ready for what he is called to accomplish. His obedience is leading him toward the completion of his mission. We've, we've already got that there. But what about us? Are we living out our purpose? Richard Halverson, this, who served as the as the chaplain of the Senate from the early 80s to the mid-90s, said something that lingers within me. And I'm not sure the exact quote, but it goes something like this. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is with you. And wherever you are, God has put you there. Now, my intention is not to cause a heated argument between the anti-Baptist and the Calvinist among us. Us Presbyterians have made enough news for the week, and we have plenty to argue about. So Halverson's quote is not to discuss the difference between free will and predestination or accidental and choice. That would be treacherously boring, by the way. It is to discover that wherever you go, there is purpose. Wherever you are, lost, found, wavering, wondering, you still have purpose. You always have the opportunity to do great things. No matter where you are, each one of us always has the opportunity to respond in a loving Christ-like way, wherever, whenever. It's not an accident, not really. An accident is an incidental or unplanned event with, that lacks intention. Our journey of faith is not accidental. There is always purpose. The wherever we are now, today, tomorrow, does not determine the purpose of why we are there. Not really, not on the level that I invite you to ponder. The purpose is the reason for which something or someone exists. It is the reason for which you exist. What does Jesus say? I have come to this, for this reason I have come. 
when Karen and I ventured out on our own in the old city of Jerusalem to walk to Via Della Rosa and to do some shopping, we got lost, even with the map. And um, you'll never hear me admit it in front of Karen. And I will say that that's not what I said in church. But we got lost more than once. We ended up where we did not want to be. There in the holy of holy cities, where we did not want to be, Halverson's words popped into my head. You go nowhere by accident because where you go, God is with you. If God is with you, there is purpose. And it was oddly com comforting to realize that I had purpose. And perhaps it simply was not to be afraid of the hostile shouting voices or the penetrating glares that came away. Maybe it was just simply to breathe and to experience the history of the Jaffa Gate. Now, I know that accidents happen. I mean, there are car accidents all the time. I get that. But the point is not to focus on the mishap. The point that I offer you is to realize that every place is waiting for you. Every place, there is opportunity to be a redemptive presence and influence. Everywhere is a place to express core values like love and acceptance and inclusion. Every place, everywhere is an opportunity to embody the one who lives in you. You go nowhere by accident because God goes with you. My purpose, your purpose, our purpose is less about what you do and more about who you are. And we are people of good news. So let me say this clearly everywhere you go. You are needed to positively impact people everywhere you go. You are needed to positively impact people and to help nurture an enduring discipleship everywhere you go. Because you go no place by accident because an accident assumes lack of intention. And as people of faith, we are people with intention because God goes with you wherever you go. So let me close with a story. It's a man, about a man who netted three trout from a stream and he carefully placed the three trout on a grassy spot on the bank. And before he caught them, the trout swam like a, a liquid ballet in motion, gracefully and vibrant and alive. But after he netted them, there was another story. They were motionless, fixed on that grassy area, gasping for air. They looked, they acted stupid. So the man noticed that they seemed unhappy. So he talked to them, hoping that he could encourage them to change. Little fish, he said, don't be sad. You'll like the grass. Just try it for a while but no movement from the trout, no response, no change. And a few seconds passed, and a man's neighbor walked by and said, hey, Bob, come and check out these fish. And Bob walked over, and the man ex explained that he was sure that the fish could make an adjustment. I'm sure that the fish could prosper on the grass. Don't you agree? Well, his neighbor said, why not? So he tried to tell the fish it would be good if they learn to live on the grass. And after all, the neighbor loved grass, so why shouldn't the fish? But still, the fish never blinked. They just lay there looking dumber every second. So finally, a little boy approached and said, what are you doing? Little boy, out of the mouths of babes. Little boy comes, what are you doing? Put them back. They can't be all that they've been created to be when they are out of the water. Well, the man scratched his head a bit and finally convinced he put the trout back into the stream. And, you know, after a few seconds of splashing, off they went effortlessly. 
And again, it was like liquid ballet. What ease, what grace, what beauty. We are a people with purpose, created to live out our identity, even if it feels like we're out of our element. Even if the world has changed so much and we're lost in space or we feel ineffective, motionless, unable, we have great purpose. Be obedient and live a Christ-like life. You go nowhere by accident. Everywhere you go, everywhere you go, today, tomorrow, and the years to come, is a place that you are able to embody the one who lives in you. Everywhere you get to embody Christ. And that's our good news message for the day. Thanks be to God. Amen.